So I selected that uh, text as the focus of our message this morning. With this message of God's tenderness, Zechariah softens the tone. I'm reading now the Leader Magazine's um, introduction. Softens the tone of Malachi's warning of a purifying fire. Yet no one is exempt from this cleansing process. To communicate the message of freedom in Christ, we need to be freed ourselves from the chains that bind us. So God's actions in Advent, like the refiner's fire that burns away impurities, reveals our true selves. So even as we go through the necessary self-examination and repentance, we can trust that God will bring to completion the good work begun in us. Philippians 1. Preparation for seed to grow involves disturbing and agitating the soil, breaking up the places that have become hardened and compacted. Similarly, the prophets stir up our hearts and minds, preparing a way for the Lord. The question becomes, how are we getting ready for God's coming? What needs to be stirred up, brought to light, so that God's mercy can burst in and break out? Unquote. The words of the text were of John the Baptist's father. When John the Baptist was little son. And they had clarity from the prophetic words and from Mary's visit with Elizabeth and from uh, the reality that Elizabeth had been barren until her old age and that, and that was uh, pregnant. They had all kinds of clarity. But there was going to be something unique about John the Baptist, this young man. And as we know the story, he was the one who Prepared the way, preached repentance. God used him to call that generation into an openness, at least a confrontation with whether or not they would each be open to Jesus. Find in your uh, bulletins, if you would, the uh, little uh, insert that we have uh, today for. Collecting uh, these after each message in Advent. And we did this week place extra copies uh, along the center row because we were reminded last week that a lot of families just get one bulletin and then they need uh, extras. So uh, just, uh, you know, um, reach around and help yourself to the extras if you need them. So today, the thought being God's mercy, the invitation would be to write something here. Knowing God's mercy has washed over me and wanting to offer others more meaningful mercy, I forgive the following. We can't offer mercy if we haven't forgiven. So I forgive the following and choose to trust that God will be a better judge than me of this matter, which I believe is what motivates us to forgive. It's not that it doesn't need addressed, not that there's not legitimate judgment expected. A choice to forgive someone declares by faith that God is a better judge than me and turns over from hanging on to that demand of justice, turns that over to God to be the one who follows through. For those of you who weren't here last week, the uh, junior youth Sunday school class will then be uh, taking these, creating uh, change out of the papers that we submit and on our first Sunday of January, our annual covenant renewal Sunday, these will be run through the paper shredder as a way of our, again, turning over to the Lord the things that we've committed to Him. So we're recognizing in, this morning in the text that mercy washes over us. And in the opening verses, I'm suggesting mercy washes over us from Holy Spirit words of promise. The Father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives a prophecy. The Holy Spirit prompted him to speak words that released hope and released mercy. 
And part of the words that Zechariah spoke was a reminder that God has not been silent down through the generations of time. We serve a speaking God. God spoke through the prophets. God spoke in giving the written word. Today we're being reminded that God yet speaks. We have that same Holy Spirit in us to speak to us. We have God's written word that we can open like the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives and to our world. So simple imagery, this washing over us imagery. Picture yourself on the uh, hottest summer day doing the most miserable dirty work you ever did. Does it bring back a memory? How good it felt to have water wash over you after that sweaty, dirty, really smelly day's work. And you sense the water clean. God's mercy washes over us. We're called to mind a day that you work really, really hard. You pushed yourself so hard, every muscle ached. And remember how good it felt to either stand in a hot shower or soak in a hot tub and just sense God's mercy washing, penetrating deep to soothe and to restore. That's the imagery we yearn for this morning anew. Because the Word yet speaks. The Holy Spirit yet prompts. So what scriptures, when you hear them, create a stop and a pause and release a sense of the mercy and the favor of God? I'm going to uh, give a number of you opportunity here shortly to recite a scripture that has that kind of effect on you. Several weeks ago at Ellen Gunning's funeral, we were reminded that for Rob and Ellen in Psalm 23, they recited it together as a married couple many, many times. Not only in her journey with cancer, but throughout life. It was Ellen's favorite scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. And she would recite that. She would sense the mercy of God washing over Shall we recite just the opening of Psalm 23 together? Together. The Lord is my shepherd. For Roy, at his funeral this week, family chose John 14. In my father's house are a lot of mansions. And since I'm up there doing all this preparation, I'm telling you folks, I'm coming back to have you go with me. So for Roy, it was this promise that where I am, there you shall be. That released a sense of peace and promise. Where I am, there you shall be. Shall we together recite these words? Where I am, there you shall be. And for Roy, it was also a hymn, which for many of us, God speaks to us also profoundly through music. Many of us more through music than preachers. That's humbling for someone to call me a preacher, but it's true. Music touches the heart. And for Roy, it was a song, How Great Thou Art. Something about being a trucker on the open road. Something about his sense of the faithfulness of God that released that song in Roy's spirit. The Lord, oh God, how great thou art. There's been many scriptures that have ministered to me over the years, but one of the ones early on in my ministry, when I had been profoundly impacted by the reality that God was calling me into ministry, this quiet, shy boy who couldn't look anybody in the eye when I was young, a huge inferiority complex. 
God was calling me. So Philippians 1 6 became deeply, profoundly important. Be confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. See, I knew God had saved me, obviously, I knew as quiet and fear. I couldn't have saved myself. There was no doubt in my mind that the saving had been all God's work. And I was deeply grateful. But somehow I was tempted when God called me into ministry to think that now I had to somehow accomplish it. That's always been my, one of my weak places. And that's essentially an idolatry of the heart. An overestimation of one's own sex versus reminding oneself, no, when God calls you, God will do it. Now you have to be willing to cooperate, but it's very different to cooperate than it is to originate. And so this promise became profound. He who started the work is the one who will complete it. Just cooperate with me, and I'll get it done in the name of Jesus. And so when I pause and I grab a hold again of that promise, I go, God's mercy washing over me. Because I'm profoundly aware of my own inabilities and adequacies. God's mercy washing over me. So what scripture is it for you? It releases a sense of God's mercy. Romans 8 1. There, therefore, there is no condemnation to those of the Lord. Can we say together, no condemnation for those who love the Lord. Okay? No condemnation for those who No condemnation. over us from holy 
Spirit, words of promise. The second thing I see in our text is that mercy, mercy washes over us as fear of enemy no longer controls us. We're saved from our enemies, from those who hate us. He's rescued us from our enemies so we can serve God without fear, in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. Now note, there is no expectation there that we won't have enemies. And actually, um, it wasn't until later that they caught on to the reality that God's new definition of salvation from enemies wasn't going to be that they wouldn't at points impact us, wound us, or even kill us. That was the wrestling of needing to accept or reject Jesus' definition of salvation as not being deliverance by an army of the people of Israel against their physical enemies, but instead a strengthening of the core of his followers to be able to live in the face of hatred, to live in the face of challenge, to live in the face of enemies, and be trusting in God that if it kills us, even our death does not separate us from the love of God. And we live in such a world yet today, obviously. Reminded again, it's all through the news. It seems to be happening. Well, I saw the map on Facebook of all of the places in our land just this year. And it was every state practically. Mass shootings. Some of them catch our attention in the mass media. And there's so many of them that some of them just kind of put on the energy to pay attention. But it's becoming a profound awareness in America that the enemy is also within. Now, I don't think we can read these kind of scriptures and say that that should touch us with fear. We can't control feelings. It's a natural response to be afraid. The question is, is the fear going to define us? Is it going to limit us? Is it going to be our identity place, our resting place? Is it going to be what motivates our words and our actions? Or will faith have us press through in the face of the fear to be a witness to the victory of Jesus? Someone who experiences the trauma of a active shooter or military service or the death of a loved one through a car accident will likely experience post-traumatic stress disorder. The rewiring of the brain towards trauma. You can't do anything about whether or not it touches you in that way, whether you're a Christian or you're not. But the question is, will you allow that to define you the rest of your life or if you're a follower of Jesus, or even if you're not a follower of Jesus, we have the courage and the boldness to go after healing to the best possible way that you can, to get counseling, to surround yourself with people who will walk you out of the darkness back into light, to, as much as possible, not withdraw into depression, but settle to find healing, restoration, and manage it versus it managing you. I hope and pray that if I'm ever in an environment with an active shooter, I hope and pray that I have the courage to go towards to confront versus cower. I don't think any of us know until we're confronted. I hope and pray that if I'm in an environment where it's the Christians who are being selected out, that I have the courage to say, yes, I'm a believer in Jesus. Motivated by faith and faithfulness, not fear. 
I think it's also we do need to address fear. We need to acknowledge it. We need to face it. We need to try to apply faith to it. I think we also need to so that mercy washes over us and we remember that the fear of enemies should no longer control us. I think we also have to maintain a sense of perspective. Part of why it impacts us so drastically is because we live now in a completely connected world. So these incidents happen anywhere and they feel like they happen to us and feel like they touched us whether they did or not. Before radio and TV and communication, crazy things always happen in other places in the world. But we kept farming our farms and going to our businesses and baking and cooking and working in the garden, all unaware that a slaughter had happened somewhere in the world. Now, every time it happens, it touches us. So it's good as Christians to face the reality, but also to maintain a sense of perspective. I think it's also important to, as much as possible, maintain a sense of, a sense of humor. To reclaim the value of story and laughter, reading through the Time magazine testimonies of the uh, <coughs> shooting in uh, the church in South Carolina. That's one of the things they said. They have to keep reclaiming the stories of life and, and, this, and the, the things that release laughter together. So, Dottie told one um, at the uh, boys' uh, service in the fellowship hall after the meal. She said uh, they had a problem with the groundhogs in the backyard. She said, you know, Roy was just a gentle, gentle spirit, and he loved animals, but this groundhog was a problem. She said, Roy, Roy, you need to shoot that groundhog. She put the, the gun, the you know, bullets, so that next time she saw the groundhog, he could shoot the groundhog. And sure enough, he was home from on the road, and she looked out, and out there's the groundhog. And she said, Roy, there's the groundhog. And she said, and then she kind of imitated how it happened. Roy slowly got up out of the chair, walked across to the gun, picked up the gun, and she said, well, as you know, by the time he got to the open window, the groundhog was gone. <laughs> so she said she borrowed a uh, have a heart trap and put some bait in it and set it, and sure enough, Roy's home one time, and the groundhog's in the have a heart trap. She said, Roy, there's the groundhog. Take the gun out and finish that thing. He goes out. After a while, he comes back in. She hadn't heard the gun go off. She said, Roy, what happened? She said, or he said, well, I got out there. He was laying in the bottom of the trap like he was dead. So I opened the door and shook him out and he ran off. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, I soon figured out if I want the groundhog taken care of, I have to wait till Roy's on the road, and then when I caught the groundhog, I'd call Bryce Petersheim and he'd take care of it. <laughs> I went to her table afterwards, I said, I guess the moral of the story is if you want something shot, you call Petersheim. <laughs> <laughs> Light, light, light. So even in the, uh, you know, the day that she was experiencing grief and remembrance, Dottie was strong enough to honor Roy. She talked too about how faithful he was as a husband, but to also tell a story of you. I thought uh, this morning was another room. Humorous coincidence. My wife, when she recognized uh, the deep hunting culture of this congregation, she likes to kind of uh, you know, poke at sacred cows, and so she started this dust bunny hunt for uh, women. And on the uh, Sunday that uh, men were off the mountains, um, now this next generation, as Nelson recognized, the women are also becoming successful hunters, but you know, in our generation, the men would go up to the mountains and the women would stay home. So Cindy started a dust buddy hunt for uh, the women. And uh, they have 
lunch together and they go off and have a good time. I don't know what all they do, but I'm sure they laugh and uh, have a good time. So that's today, the Dust Bunny Hunt. And here in this morning's coming strip, Pickles, uh, this old couple, I, I, I enjoy this one. And this morning, on the morning of Dust Bunny Hunt, the old man sitting at the table and his wife comes into the kitchen. He says, how's your foot this morning? And she says, my foot? Yeah. Last night I dreamed you and I went hunting. You were wearing your pink bunny slippers. <laughs> you stuck your foot out from behind the tree and I, well, you know. <laughs> and she says, incredulously, you shot my bunny slipper in your dream? And he says, it was looking at me in an aggressive manner. <laughs> you know I have bunny issues. Humor. <laughs> so mercy washes over us. The Holy Spirit word. Mercy washes over us as we find ways to no longer live in fear of enemies such that it controls us. And I see finally then the text, mercy washes over us as we recognize each generation can help prepare the way of the Lord. Zechariah, you, my little son, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. And so we know that uh, John the Baptist did indeed Prepare the way of the Lord. And so he's remembered all these 2,000 years later. But cannot each of us also recognize when we held a child in our, in our hands or in our arms, whether it's our child or a child gifted to the congregation in this profound sense of the mercy of God, generation to generation. God's mercy shows up incarnate in the flesh in our children. It's one of the strengths of this congregation. 250 years, generation to generation. Now God is favoring us with new young families, bringing their children for all of us to speak into their lives help mold and shape them, to help make church a safe place for them, to love them and bless them and mold them. I Skyped with uh, Jeremiah and Shayla, Jeremiah, <coughs> this week, mission workers in France, came to love and respect when they were with us this summer. He asked if I would mentor him since he's stepping for the first time into a pastoring role in France. So we Skype. And you know, I heard again a profound sense of God's faithfulness when they chose to go forward with their concert of peace, involving all the religious leaders of that city, which they had been planning for months and now was scheduled for one week after the terrorist attack in Paris. And the profound sense of God's blessing when they chose to go forward with that concert of peace. I also asked about uh, the children because they had asked us to be in prayer. The children were experiencing a touching of the heart, going to school, hearing a lot of anxiety and fear. And Jeremiah thanked us for our prayers testify that although it's still a reality, yes, they are uh, sleeping better and doing well. And there's no doubt in my mind that that kind of faithfulness on our part empowers the next generation to prepare the way of the Lord. We also experience that generational blessing, not only in our children, but in new people who come from the community. They weren't born men of, but they embraced an Anabaptist 
understanding by faith. And so as we were discerning these five qualified candidates as elders, we recognized there were represented in quality individuals, the three who particularly um, said they uh, could participate in the process. Um, the one value that we've articulated represented well in Dan and Mike is commitment to be raising up the leaders of the next generation, represented in body right there, those 20 year olds, profoundly knowing they would make a contribution. And then the second value is our commitment to be relevant to the community, to outreach. And there's Sam Waters as a candidate. Anabaptist by choice. Through his counseling ministry, is more connected to the community probably than any of the rest of us. So who are we going to choose? And I came into the final circle wrestling. What are we going to do with two high values, deeply gifted, and we only have room for one? And God led. We recognize we do have already on the past 14, two in their 20s, Rachel and Brendan. But uh, Mike and Dan each have a sense that the time is not right. I think they'll have more opportunities. And uh, Sam had a sense that he wants to submit his name if uh, we confirm it. So the circle of discernment came to one mind, just so recommend. Now the choice is before you. Mercy washes over us. As we recognize the word of the Lord still speaks. Mercy washes over us. As we replace fear of enemy with faith. Mercy washes over us. As we recognize each generation and help prepare the way of the Lord. So what situation would God have you forgive or forgive more deeply? Right? And when going to him, pass it to this aisle and this aisle. Extras outside if you need it. Just take 30 seconds of silence. I forgive the Father and choose to trust that Jesus will be a better judge than me at this moment. Thank you. 